I'm delighted to say Andy Moran is with us. Andy, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Morning, lads. Uh, before we get into the football, we may as well talk about real life. Um, lo level three lockdown as a, as a gym owner and an operator and who obviously wants your clients to come into you. How has this been and, and how are you getting on with that? It's the uncertainty of it all in business, really, which is the problem. It's, um, it's, it, it, it's, we're, we're, we're okay. We're one of the lucky ones where we've got kind of multiple businesses where we've got a gym and a leisure center. We've got uh, small areas too for individual training where we can do that. So we can keep open, but it's uncertainty of where we're going from now on is the, is the big problem. And it's the, I suppose the co consumer confidence. And like, if you know the way gyms run, you do guys. So you buy a month, you buy three months, or you buy a year, you know, and how do you, if you're a customer, how do you decide what you're going to buy? How long are they going to remain open? You know, what's going to happen in level four and all that kind of uncertainty is there ahead of everyone, you know? Yeah, totally. And, and as an industry, I, like, I don't know what the representative body for the industry is or how you even make representations as a big group to say, look, this is an important outlet for people. You can see the physical benefits, you can see the mental health benefits, you can see the business benefits. Like if there was some decision made that irrespective of what level we're at, a certain element of access was going to be available, then at least you would have certainty to your clients and say, well, if you do sign up for a year, I know I can give you X number of classes or X number of contact hours. Exactly. I think that's the, the major point for being. It's underestimated how important industry is to people. Um, we've got a group there. They're special needs adults uh, with their carers and they come into us, you know, and they, we've assigned a room to them. So they all live together. So they come in and work out together. But the importance they have to do an hour in the gym, to go away around, walk for the lake, and then they come back in and do an hour in the pool. And it, it, it's the highlight of their day. It's their outlet for the day. So people just look at young, fit people like ourselves but they don't look at the greater community and what the importance of a, a leisure centre can have for people in, within that community. I mean, it's nice of you to butter us up by including us in uh, our, ourselves there, Andy, as a plural, but uh, compliment taken, but uh, swiftly batted away by myself and Owen. Yeah, look, I, I still think of myself being 25. I still have, I, I need to get this out of my head, you know? Well, look, that's a good point. And you were, you were still lepping around like a young thing. We saw that uh, nationally televised club matches a short season, were you thinking, ah, Jesus, I've retired one season too early? Oh, for the for the county? Yeah. For the county setup? Oh, absolutely not. Um, my pro like, what I'm missing most from it is the structure the, in which it gives you. So, geez, we'd be on Thursday here, and I'd be still thinking it's Tuesday. Do you know the structure of training? And they always knew on... You, you, you recover from the weekend, you get yourself right for Tuesday night's training, then you get yourself right for Friday and you do your weights in between. So you always have a structure to your week. What I'm missing is the structure. And I've struggled with the structure since last October. So we got fed in 2019 in the club uh, county final in, in 2019. And since then, I wouldn't say I've lifted too many weights uh, from that point to this point. So uh, no, I, I, I certainly didn't retire uh, a season too early. And the, the prospect of having two... Uh, pre-seasons one after another one now and one in a couple of months time wouldn't be a great appeal to me either <laughs> moving forward so there was no uh, after like it looked like you were definitely enjoying yourself in the, in the club there was no chats no kind of casual soundings out from the management or from you to kind of go ah, look sure it's only five weeks I could do that yeah I was lucky enough to play okay in the first half of the uh the club game that was televised. Uh, you didn't see the ones that weren't televised. There wasn't. Uh, <laughs> some of them weren't too pretty. But um, no, I, honestly, there wasn't. I think um, even pre-2019, I remember when James took the job uh, at the end of 2018 and he rang me. I think we were pretty aware that it was going to be my last season, even at that stage. You know? And as the season went on, that, that, that just became more and more evident. My time became less and less um, the influence I was having on the pitch, yes, I was still coming on and doing okay when I was coming on, but the influence I was having on the pitch was becoming less and less as well, and it was time to move on. And I, I suppose bringing it into the Mayo setup then is that we're in a time now of, I wouldn't call it complete transition, but we're in a time now it's, it, it was time for the likes of me to move away because when the likes of James Carr, when the likes of Darren Cohn and these guys are playing, it's important to give them the freedom to actually play. And with me looking over their shoulder, the temptation of always putting the likes of myself on, I think it was time just to move away and give these guys the freedom to kind of to move to better themselves as well. Did, did you get a sense that you were providing a, a positive on that front as well, where they were trying to bring their standards up to their highest level, that even if you weren't starting games, you had that huge role to play in terms of keeping those standards high? Yeah, I... I 
I think that has to be really balanced. I, like I know myself as an inside forward, you're, you know, like you, you, we've all been part of the games. If it's not going well, you take away the car, you take off the corner forward, you know. Um, but it's like to get. I, I I do believe people need. You see it in the Premiership all the time. Young players need the freedom to know that like. The Grim Reaper, like myself, isn't looking over their shoulder to, and they'll come on as soon as it's not going well. If you miss your first shot, you know that the, the, the manager might be tempted to put this older player on. So I think there's a balance. Yes, of course, you can uh, use it to make them better themselves and always be improving. But there comes a time, too, where that player just needs to get out of the way, really, and let the young player develop and build and not be afraid to make them mistakes as well. Did you take uh, one-on-one sessions with any of the cornerbacks in the Mayo team? Because that's one of the things that Bernard Brogan talks about quite a bit in, in his book, that he'd work a bit with Mick Fitzsimons, and uh, Fitzsimons will say, will you make the run that Andy Moore will make at the weekend? Were you doing something similar? Ah, they, they, there's, there's, there's a guy that I'm in, incredibly indebted to all through the 2015, 16, 17. There's a guy called Keelan Crow. You'd know very little about him, but he, a, a club player from Gary Moore, was part of the squad. I found him exceptionally hard to mark, you know. But I used to run to him uh, any time there was a game on. I used to run to mark him because he was stronger than me. He'd similar sort of pace to me. So I found a really kind of struggle. I, like I used to really struggle to mark him, and like we used to have little discussions during it. And I, I'd be telling him, "Listen, I'm going to try something different in the game. Don't heed me. Just play your own game and see see how it goes." So, um, yeah, I'd use him. It's funny that Bernard used mixed with Simons. I'd use. Keelan as Mick Fitzsimons and then try to kind of work around that to see how we could kind of develop but um, I did I only heard part of the interview with Bernard but um, yeah that's really interesting to hear that like Ger Cafferty uh, you all know Ger but Ger is, is is a student of the game he's a cent- like he'd be in the warm up area he'd be marking everything he'd be marking chairs he'd be marking poles in the warm up area he'd be doing everything so you have no ch- you have no choice just to go in and talk to him and kind of develop with him as well so them two guys were a major help to me kind of all through the years, really, with, with uh, developing my game to mark the best players. All that c- corporate knowledge that you guys have, do you ever feel like it would be useful to get into management soon while all that knowledge is still current? Or do you feel like the best thing to do is to kind of take a little break from that whole environment and maybe sample other environments and have a look around before... I, look, I'm, I'm assuming at some point you want to get into management. I don't know that you do. But it just seems like, as a student of the game and as somebody who thinks deeply about the ebb and flow of matches and who has the experience that you have, that at some point it would make sense. Uh, yeah, it's it's like I kind of made no kind of... Um, I haven't dressed it up, really. It's it, it's something I want to do. Um, it's something that I want... I, I think you get the sense when you're involved in it, you're either going to be good at it or bad at it. And if, if you're good, you can develop and you keep, keep moving. Inside that five to six years, if you go into uh, club coaching or county coaching, you will get the feel for it if, OK, listen, I'm actually quite good at this. I can go and develop it. I can move it on. So that's the kind of point I'm at at the minute. I'm, I went in and I coached the under-20s with uh, Mike Solon this year with Mayo. Um, unfortunately, we lost to Galway on penalties. And then I, co- I coached the Valadrine club team this year as well. So I've already kind of moved into that kind of sphere. Um, I've never kind of uh, shied away from that's what I want to do. And um, I'll kind of keep moving into that into 2021. And like looking at the different types of management and coaching teams that we have, ultimately, I suspect as, as somebody who has shown leadership, do you want to be the manager? Because that's the bit where you get to make the final decisions. At the same time, the good managers clearly understand coaching and you, you need to be able to build a coaching team that's going to work with the players that you have and in, in, in instill the style of play, inflict the style of play if it's required. So do you, do, you, do you learn the coaching side of it and get up to a point where you're like, okay, I can have those conversations at a very deep level with individuals and with coaches at the same time learning the management structures of, you know, obviously everybody's going to be different, but we saw what Jim Gavin did. We've seen what Liam Sheedy's done. We saw what Pat Gilroy did. We, you know, you obviously have intimate knowledge of what, what has happened at Mayo, and that has been very successful over the years. So what are you? Are you a coach first and then a manager, or are you always being a manager while just getting up to skills, up in the skills with the coaching side of it? No, most certainly um, it's the coaching aspect on, on the field that I'm, I'm interested in. Um, but I, I think we, we've seen a shift. It's, it's gone. It's moved from the... I suppose if we steal a, um, a comparison to soccer uh, and the most famous one of Alex Ferguson being a manager and Carlos Quiros and all these guys being being the coach, I think that's moved. I think that's shifted. I think McGuinness has shifted that. I think Jim Guinness shifted that. If you look at Davey, 
Davy Fitz in the in the hurling, he shift like it's all shifted towards that. It's head coach nearly. It's 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 the rugby structure, isn't it? Really, it's the head coach, and then you'll have a manager kind of managing all the kind of structures in between. But I think now the way young people are, the way they take in information, the the the, the main person needs to be nearly the coach on the field at this at this at this moment. That would be my opinion. Um, of course, there's different ways of doing things. It's like business. It's like everything. But that would be my opinion. How it's done. The the head coach has to be the man on the pitch, kind of directing what's what's happening around the training field. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And I think the point you're making about young people in particular, everybody wants to be coached. They have a thirst for knowledge and a thirst to get better. And it's even maybe that's a shift in in generations from people kind of resenting, oh, who you tell me what to do, is actually like, tell me how do I get better here. Yeah, it, it, it's gone. Like the, the most exciting thing now about this national league is which team is going to reinvent themselves. I think we're going to see something. I think we're going to see something different. Um, and what team is that going to be? Who's going to be the team that comes out and says, right, okay, this is the way we're going to play. Like what Donegal did, like what Dublin have done, uh, done uh, since Eric Kerry's Tyrone's got to come out with something new and see can they, the other teams go and beat it. So, yeah, young fellas now want information. Where do you want me to play? How do you want me to do it? What kind of freedoms do I have within that within that format? And then they just go out and kind of express themselves the best they can. Andy, I make Kerry slight favourites over Dublin at the moment, given the the retirements and the unavailable players for Dublin, and given that we saw Kerry reach a level last year that they're going to be even better this year because their younger players are a year on, a year stronger. Am I completely ridiculous in that? No, I think there's a big uh, big uh, shift in, in in Kerry. I think. The addition of Peter Crowley back into the squad is huge. Um, I don't think it can be underestimated. Now you have uh, you have Sullivan uh, in the back line, you have Foley, um, you have Ty, Ty Morley, you have Crowley, and the way they run up the field now, that like the day Kerry were so much different last year. It's, I, I think it's maybe it's slightly hard to explain, but like you have Tom Sullivan coming up scoring one three, one four in a championship from corner back. You know, really driving the fullbacks back. You have Morley doing the same thing. You have Foley doing the same thing. And now you had, had Crowley into that mix. You have five fellas or four fellas on a, on a back line who can really drive on, you know, which is huge. Um, it, it, it's huge. So I, I think, yes, I would be excited about to see the way Kerry are. But Dublin, <laughs> I said this during the week. I've written them off so many times. I thought Jared Brennan retires. I think, yeah, okay, he's a, he's the cog, he's the six, he's the he's the man that controls everything. This this sorted out. Rory O'Carroll retires. He's the main fullback. All of a sudden, Johnny Cooper, Mick Fitzsimon step up, and now Joe Bernard does his cruise shit. You think they're in trouble? Jermyn uh, retires. Okay, Owen O'Gara retires. Okay, they're in trouble. But then you go through it and they have Mannion, Khan, Kilkenny, Scully. Do you know, would Jeremy play? Like, would he start? Do you know, and it's yes, they have a lot of retirements. Um, but you keep McCarthy, you keep Fenton, you keep uh, John you know, the, the Howard and these guys, and you you keep them fit. Do you know, that team that that team is a good team, and uh, I still think they're the team to beat. Can I ask you about that Connolly retirement, uh, Andy? Because uh, we actually didn't really get a, a Mayo voice uh, to, on to talk about it at the time when actually the relationship between Mayo and Dermot Connolly is definitely one of the most uh, interesting rivalries we've had in recent times. Uh, how much did you prepare for Dermot Connolly specifically in terms of how you would try and get under his skin before those massive games you had with the Dubs? Yeah, I don't know if you noticed. I didn't really ever get too <laughs> too near to Jeremy <laughs> Connolly, but uh, I used to stay well up the other side of the field. But um, how did we prepare? Dublin was a funny one because you'd always try to drop somebody in against everybody else. So you'd you'd drop maybe a ten or a twelve in to make the extra number in the back in case they they come uh, come running through. I think we could compete with Dublin. Unfortunately, we never got over them to win the All Ireland, but I think we could compete with Dublin because we had the backs to go one-on-one -on -one with them. And we had two absolute colossus of midfielders for us in Shamey and Tom, Shamey O'Shea and Tom Parsons, who literally could just you know, compete with, not beat, I'm not saying they're better or anything of the sort, but I'm saying if you want two guys who are going to be honest, who are going to defend strongly against two midfielders, they were the guys to do it. And we had them guys to compete with the midfielders, which never created an overlap. Now, also, we had outstanding uh, backs. I, I suppose if you look at Colin, Colin Boyle, he's four All-Stars. Lee is four All-Stars. And Keith and you've Chris Barrett and you've all these guys thrown in amongst them. You have outstanding backs there as well. So we could actually compete one-on-one. -on -one. Now, the famous battle is Jeremy V. Lee. Um, 
and Lee kind of gets under your skin anyway. Do you know, he's that sort of competitive character. He makes you so frustrated. You can't get away from him. He doesn't really need to tend to have to foul you because he's so strong and so fast. So the German one was basically, the point I'm trying to get to was, was always just a one-on-one -on -one for us. It was never uh, where we had to double up on him because we had someone like Lee Keegan to go and mark him. Now, when Lee got sent off, Stephen Cohen came on and actually did a really good job on him in 2016. But usually you'd put a man-to-man -man marker on him and then he, he, he was okay because you could trust Lee to mark him. The biggest problem you had with Jeremy Connolly, and sorry for drawing it out, but the biggest problem you had was when he used to come on off the bench. And when he used to come on off the bench, that was an issue because now fellas are tiring. Now you probably have to look at your bench and see, right, who we're going to put one to one on Jeremy Connolly. And if you look at the damage Jeremy has done in All Ireland finals, a lot of that against Kerry, against Mayo, and against these teams was coming off the bench when you simply probably didn't have the legs to mark him or you probably didn't have someone to come on and mark him. That is really interesting. I, I hadn't actually thought about. Uh... Dublin using Connolly in that way on purpose as a, a means of setting the opposition off balance with 10, 15, 20 minutes left to go when the game is in the melting pot. The other thing that we really wanted to talk to you about was um, during the week, obviously, the footage emerged from some somebody uh, recording Jim McGuinness training in Galway. And it reminded us of the mad speculation that um, Stephen Rochford had got McGuinness involved in a training session with Mayo. How aware were you about those rumours at the time? Did you hear anything about it? Because we'd, we'd DB in studio with us going, geez, that'd be great. And then getting a text live on the air going, I can categorically state they've never had a conversation in their lives. To this day, I don't know if it's true or not. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 we didn't. We never did. Uh, DB is, uh, yeah, yeah, DB. Um, yeah, so it, like, I, I remember that. We had a great old laugh about that. Um, I know it was it was uh, it was good fun, but like in fairness to to Rochford at the time, Stephen Rochford at the time, we had a backroom team. We had an amazing backroom team. You had Donny Buckley, uh, the famous coach from Kerry. You had Tony McEntee, Joe Kane, and you had Peter Burke. We had so much knowledge in in the backroom team at the time. We found it quite fascinating that we were even attempted to bring someone else in. And at, at the time too, we had Neil Fitzpatrick, who was our uh, performance coach, which which was great as well. Um, now listen. Jim McGuinness is in addition to any team. Um, we all kind of know that, like, well, the guys that are old enough knew that he was in college with Porrick um, in Tralee. I think, I'm not sure they did the full three in a row together, but that Tralee team won three Sigersons in a row just before just before my time going to college, and they were a terrific team. And like the rest of you, I got the video on WhatsApp, and, um, yeah, I thought it was very impressive by Joyce, um, if I'm being honest, um, for a man of his calibre to have... John, I, I don't know how you would put it. Would you put it the lack of ego or the humility? You know, humility to go and get someone like Jim McGuinness to come down. I think it, it says an awful lot about Porter Joyce. Um, and I think it's it, it can't be a negative in any sort of way to have a person of Jim McGuinness qualities there. If he's a performance coach, if he's a coach on the pitch, even if he's just coming in to give you one day just to freshen it up, John, you know, if Jim McGuinness is around the place, John, you know, you're. The player's ego kind of says, right, I want to impress this guy. I want to show him what he can do. And, of course, it's a, it's a positive to go with. So there was never any involvement with Mayo. That's it. That's it. No, we're, we're getting the no. truth. No. <laughs> Not that I know of. Anyway, I, I never, I never, I've, I've, I've never met Jim uh, in a, in a, off, off a playing pitch, really, do you know? You know, you never spoken to Jim McGuinness in your life as uh, as David Brady would put it. Maybe, yeah. maybe Brady was maybe Bra Brady, Brady was onto something. I know where I did talk to her or something, but no, I don't, I don't think I have to be honest. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, like that. This is the, the exact sort of way a team should have been looking for the last six years. You know, it's like who's the one coach who managed to to, to beat the Dubs in in their recent run. I mean, and for for him to have not been brought in by by any of the, the top tier setups until now is actually, uh, I guess, a little bit surprising. Yeah, I would say it wasn't from lack of effort, though. I'd say an awful lot of teams probably did get a hold of him. But I'd say Jim committed to the soccer side of it. And when you kind of put all, like, I would say to, to go between sports from Gaelic to soccer, I don't think you can have much to, um, you can't get distracted. You can't, uh, I don't think you can have that. Uh, no, I'm talking here, I was me hat, really. I'm talking about Jim McGuinness. But in my view, he, 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 he 
I wouldn't say he was he was getting lack of offers. No, I'd say there was offers coming off the table for him. But I'd say it was his decision that okay, I've committed to the soccer for me to be really excellent at this. I need to put everything I have into making sure I was good good enough to go cross sport into the soccer world. You know. Yeah. The other thing is, of course, the dubs changed after the template that Donegal used that day to beat them. They changed radically. They they invented a. a a new position for Keanu Sullivan to play, which was uh, not really a six at all, but actually an auxiliary six. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. what Jim had done wouldn't work anymore. You can't just flick the ball on and have runners and uh, score three goals against them and think you're going to win the game. So it, maybe, uh, you know, that, that was... I would say on that, football has changed more in the last five, six, seven years than it had done previous. So I was involved from about 2003 to 2010, Jim comes in in 11, 12. No one knows how to deal with this form of play. It's brilliant. Runners coming from everywhere. Frank McGlynn scoring points. Even the likes of Eamon McGee and these guys kicking points. Eamon won't like me saying that, but even the likes of Eamon kicking points. And, you know, and all of a sudden then in 13, 14, it began to change. They bet Dublin then in, they bet Dublin then in 14 because Dublin were wide open. And then the whole kind of tactical world was... Dublin changed just, and then everyone else then had to follow, you know? Yeah, and that's why I was asking you about getting involved, like, now, while you still have all that kind of... You, you know exactly how the teams that you're playing against are going to line up, having literally been in the stands, on the pitch, watching the warm-up, playing against the players in those games as well. So, like, I can, I can, I can see how more players from your era are going to step straight into senior management roles, senior coaching roles, as opposed to the traditional route of maybe waiting 10 years and then coming back into the game. Yeah, and the big, the big thing about that, depending on what route you go into, is having the skill set to know, okay, I've got an opinion here. Um, this guy is, like, just say you're going in with a management team. This guy, whoever the manager is, has got all these, you know, to, to balance your opinion and to make sure you don't get frustrated as well. So the, their skill sets are known. Yes, of course, you know the players, but then you got to have to be able to work with a team and kind of manage it, manage the management team as well so that your your point isn't being lost and you're not getting frustrated at what's happening as well. So there's a lot of skills that need to need to go into it, but most certainly I think there's going to be players that will, like you heard, the con I heard some of the conversation between um, Kieran and Bernard there the last day, just st stuff that was flashing up on um, social media and some of the knowledge that they were going into. I seen Kieran Donnelly talk about the Dublin press last year in... Um, in the final when they went down to 14 and bringing Cluxton out, the, the, the bit on your, I, I, I'm not sure if it was your show, but on News Talk, and it was, it, was, it was amazing to see the detail he could go into around what they were doing. And I'm not sure people that, I, I'm not sure people noticed that. I'm not sure people seen the press, like even from him talking, I was learning stuff from it. And, you know, it's, 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 it's great. It's great to see young people kind of getting involved. Yeah, no, 100%. You can listen to the full podcast on the OTV Sports app, Andy. That's the best sell that anybody's ever done for that. Listen to the whole thing, not just the short clip. Yeah, I was supposed to. I was supposed to. I just ran out of time. Ah, oh, good stuff. Great to have you with us, Andy. Thanks a million. Best of luck with the business. And if uh, we can help at all, let us know. Super. Thanks, lads. Take care.